Hey everyone, today we're going to go over the photography module of the course. So module three here, photography, which I'll be opening up shortly, has some stuff inside of it. So we're going to go through some of this right now, uh, mainly the photography basics, and then I'm going to tell you about the assignments later on. So first of all, let's open this up here. Now this is available for all of you to look at any time, but I want to also go through it and give it some more detail for what you see on this page here. So there's a lot that goes into taking pictures and using digital cameras, whether it's a SLR or a mirrorless camera. And I want to go into some of those differences here. So DSLR, and if you took the uh, Kahoot quiz, you may have gotten that right or wrong, uh, stands for Digital Single Lens Reflux. So it starts with SLR was the original film version of it. We just added on the D for digital when we got digital cameras. and now we have a new thing that's here called mirrorless. Uh, mirrorless camera has been around for a while, but it's really gaining a lot of ground. So what's the difference? Well, here we can see a cutaway between the two. So on your left, SLR or DSLR, when the light comes in through the lens here, it's actually hitting this mirror and then coming up to what we call a pentaprism or a pentamirror and reflecting to our eye through the optical viewfinder. That means whatever you see through here through the lens is what you see up here is one for one, no distortion, no modification. You might have a, an overlay of some information from your camera on top of it, but what you see is the actual picture. And when you take a picture, when you press the shutter, this mirror flips up out of the way, the shutter is exposed or the sensor is exposed to uh, light information and you create the image. With a mirrorless camera, all that mecha mechanism, all this mirror and pentaprism is removed. So you have a light coming through a lens and hitting the image sensor. And what you see in the viewfinder or on the screen back here is a digital image of what the sensor sees. So you can actually preview um, lighting effects, color, all that stuff a lot easier on a mirrorless camera because you're seeing a digital image. There are pros and cons to each. The Lumix FC300, which is available for you to sign out from the equipment room, is a mirrorless camera. For this assignment, if you do not have your own camera, please go to the equipment room, sign one of these cameras out, let me know that you did that, and I will be able to extend your reservation to the end of the term. This video right here is actually a walkthrough demonstration of what's in that kit, all the components that are inside that kit, and um, how to use the basic functions of the camera itself. So please watch this video before you take that camera out into the world and start using it for your assignments. You're going to end up using this camera for the photography and also for the video portion of the class. So you're going to be using this for the next couple of weeks. Now the cameras, the FC300s, they have fixed lenses. Those cameras are attached to the camera. You cannot change them. Uh, they are zoom lenses, but you cannot take them off and put different lenses on. More professional cameras have interchangeable lenses. So even though we're not going to use them in this class, I do want you to be aware of them and the functionalities of them, and also just point out some information that you're going to find on the cameras, on the lenses that is. So there's two different types of lenses primarily. We have what's called a prime lens and a zoom lens. So this top image right here is a prime lens. What that means is it has one focal length. Now we know this is an 85 millimeter because it says it right here. It also says it up on the ring as well. So its focal length is an 85 millimeter. And this camera lens is actually really good for portraits because it represents the, the, reproduces the image of the face most accurately versus a wide angle lens or a telephoto lens. A wider lens is gonna actually widen out a face and a telephoto is gonna narrow that face to be a little skinnier. Uh, to the right over here, this 1.4 is our widest aperture setting on this camera. So that we have a little information here. We know what the focal length is, and what the widest aperture setting for this uh, lens is. Now, aperture is something we're going to go to in a moment. Now, this lens also has autofocus and manual focus settings, which are controlled by this switch on the, on the lens itself. So on the lens, you can turn on and off manual or autofocus. Uh, and on a lot of cameras, you can also do that from the back panel as well. Now, one thing I don't see on this image, because probably on the other side of the lens, is something called a minimal focal focusing distance. So every lens has a minimal focal distance, meaning the minimal distance you have to be away from an object in order for that lens to focus on it. So if you're ever experiencing a situation where you're 
trying to focus on objects because you're really close to it and the lens doesn't, it's probably because you're too close to it. So you just have to back up a little bit. So prime lenses are good be, uh, for a variety of reasons, mainly because they give sharper images. Being a prime lens, it doesn't have any moving parts besides the focusing uh, structure inside and the aperture. So with the less uh, elements in there, it gets a sharper image. Now, of course, if you want to get closer or further away from an object, you have to physically move closer or further away. Versus something like a zoom lens, which this Canon 2470 is. So on the bottom here, we have our distance, our, our zoom distance, 24 to 70. So this is wide at 24 all the way to 70. So it's getting close to that perfect portrait size, but also is a nice uh, wide lens as well. It's a very versatile lens. Um, uh, zoom lenses are really great for events where you don't have the luxury to be able to position yourself all the time. So you have to rely on the lens itself to zoom in or zoom out to get the proper composition for your photo. This all, again, also has autofocus and manual focus and things like that. And some of these lenses also have image stabilization built into them and they might have a switch on the side. In fact, this example up top, you see it says image stabilization right on the side there. So that will help with some shakiness as well. So let's move down to the camera settings. So there's some main camera settings that you use in a combination together in order to get proper exposure for your image. So there's four settings we're gonna talk about. Three of them are about exposure. One is just about color. So your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO all affect the exposure, meaning the brightness or darkness of your image. And you have to use them in a combination together. You just don't use one without thinking about the others. They all relate to each other to make that properly exposed image. And then white balance, we'll get to the end, is how we match the proper color temperature to the lighting source in the room or outside where we are to make sure that we're telling the sensor what kind of lighting we have. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a, a blue image or a green image or a red image, and that just isn't good. So aperture uh, is the opening in the camera lens that allows light to pass through. So the wider the aperture, the more light. The smaller the aperture, the less light. We'll go with that in more detail in a moment. Shutter speed which just refers to how fast or slow the shutter opens and closes, which means how long the light is exposed to the sensor, or the sensor is exposed to light, excuse me. So the longer the sensor is exposed to light, the brighter the image. The shorter, the darker the image. And ISO is telling how sensitive that sensor is going to be to the digital brain of the camera and artificially make that image brighter. So let's start with the aperture. So like I said, the aperture is that physical opening that lets in light or doesn't let in light, depending on what your settings is. So when you have that aperture open all the way, in this example down here, we represent the aperture number and f-stop. So f-stops is a measurement of light and 2.8 on a lot of professional lenses is how wide that lens can go. Up top, when I was looking at this one, it said 1.4. So we can even go even wider, which lets even more light. This lens right here goes to 2.8. So not as much light as the prime lens. That's another advantage to prime lenses is that a lot of times you can get a wider aperture to let in more light, which also has another effect that we're going to talk about in a moment. So wide open at 2.8, we're going to let in a lot of light, which is great for low light situations. Um, you know, we're inside, we want to get as much light in as possible without having to use artificial settings. Maybe we don't have lighting available. And we go down the scale, you can see as our f-stop increases, our aperture is closing down until we get all the way to f22 here, where it's a tiny little pinhole uh, in the lens itself letting in the light. So we're getting a darker image. Now, what that is also doing is affecting the depth of field. So when we have a wide open, open aperture, we have a very shallow depth of field. And what that means is if I'm focusing on like a person's face, like if you were focusing on my face and we had a very wide aperture, meaning a shallow depth of field, anything behind me, even like right here where my hand is now, would be out of focus. And the further we get away, the further out of focus it gets. Versus 
f22 with a very small aperture, everything is now going to be focused. So that's something that's great for like landscapes. So if I want to be able to do a landscape photography and I want the flower in front of me and the mountain range all the way 10 miles away to all be in focus, I'd want to have a very small opening in my aperture to create the greatest depth of field. So you can see that in this little example right here where you have, here's our photographer friend here, there's the bear's head, and we're at maybe 2.8, maybe four for our aperture setting, and the bear is in focus by anything in front or anything behind is out of focus. And that focus, that defocusing, I should say, uh, becomes more and more as you get further and further away. Versus if we have that, say, F22, look at all the things that are in focus now. Everything from the closest tree to the bear to the mountains way in the distance are now all in focus. Again, here's another example. The photo on the left with the monkey hanging off the fence is at F2, and on the right at F22, we can see the entire fence. On the left here, the fence is out of focus. Even right, even his hand or right here is out of focus. So when you have a really wide aperture, that focus can fall off very fast based on what lens you have and how close you are to that object. So aperture does two things so far. The brightness of your image, how bright or dark it is, and your depth of field. How shallow is that depth of field or how great is it? How much is in focus in your frame? So those are the two things that aperture does. Now let's talk about the two things that shutter speed does. As I said before, shutter speed is how long your sensor is going to be exposed to light. The less time, the less light, the darker the image. The more time, more light, the brighter the image. The other thing is it's going to affect how crisp or blurry moving objects are within our image. So the faster the shutter speed, the more crisp we can capture action. So look in this example right here with the stick figure. At one one hundredth of a second, so we measure shutter speed in hundredth of a second, uh, we have a person running and they're, they're frozen in action. And as we start getting the handheld here at one twenty-fifth uh, or one sixtieth of a second, we start to get some motion blur. And then when we get below that, we're going to get a lot more blur. And we are, this is all the way to eight seconds on this scale. So if we're doing a sporting event or we're just outside and people are moving and we want to capture that action, you know, people are dancing on dance floor, we want a faster shutter speed because we want to be able to capture that action. We want to face and focus. At some point, when we get down here, hand holding, even if the object is stationary, is going to be not the best way to do it because just the movement of your hands trying to hold something steady is going to cause something to be blurry. Even if it's on a tripod, just pushing that shutter sometimes will move the camera just a little bit. In fact, if, if I'm doing stuff on a, on a tripod and we're doing long exposures, either I'm using the app on a phone or hooked up to a computer, we're setting the timer on the camera so you can like set that two second timer, hit the shutter speed, and then it, it'll do two seconds later. So there's no movement involved on the camera itself so you can get that long exposure. Now you can see here some also cool effects that you get out of that. When you have that fast shutter speed, you can see we can capture every single little spark coming off this grinder. We also see the gloves. So we are letting in more light. So we see more of the image itself. Let me click on that, make it bigger there. So you can see the, the metal over here, the gloves here, all that stuff comes in. We can see the handle of the grinder now. Um, and we can see all the little sparks. There's still some blur coming on because they're going really fast, but we can see these little ones frozen in action. Versus here on the right, at one eighth of a second, uh, we lose, we can't really see the glove, it's just a shadow now. We don't see the handle at all. The, the disc of the grinder is just black, but look at the sparks. They're flowing, they're smooth, they become something different. Both of these pictures are correct. They're just showing a different story. So when you're trying to decide whether you need blur or no blur, it's about what you want your images to represent. If I'm capturing images on a dance floor, people dancing, I might want a little blur. You know, if there's a girl dancing and she's wearing a dress and that end of the dress is moving around or the hair is flicking in the, in the air, you want a little bit of a blur on that to show that there's motion happening. You know, if everything is crisp, sometimes it just looks like someone's standing still. I always say, use the example of like cars. You know, I don't let people do cars as a photography exercise for 
fast motion because a car that's parked looks just like a car that you took at a fast shutter speed because you freeze all the action and they're right there. You want a little bit of a blur in that car movement so you can tell that it's moving. Or you want to move that camera with the car so when you take that picture, the background is slightly blurred to show that motion. So that's that's two things now. We got our aperture that controls how much light is coming in, so how bright or dark our image is, and our depth of field. Our shutter speed controls how much light hits the sensor as well for how long, so it controls how bright or dark the image is, and it also controls motion blur or sharpness based on what we're trying to achieve. So now ISO, I like to think of it as the digital brain. ISO is really a holdover term from uh, the film days because that's how you rated the sensitivity of your film, ISO 100, 400, 800. The lower the ISO, so most cameras at their lowest end are either ISO 100 or ISO 200, that's basically no digital amplification, and that's great for outdoor, lots of light. You, you know, we control control everything else with your aperture and your shutter speed. You don't need any increase in that. Versus coming inside, I might have to start at ISO 400 or 800. So you can see as we go from one to the next, we're increasing the brightness. Now the downside is once we start getting a little too high, is that you're going to start seeing digital artifacts. You can't really see it in this image. We're only going to ISO 1600, which is still a really low ISO. Some cameras go to ridiculous uh, over 100,000 ISOs nowadays. The problem is as you get into 3200, 6400, and you zoom in, you're going to start seeing that the camera is having a hard time figuring out what the colors are. You're going to see little digital artifacts here and there. So it's not going to be the best image. You want to use, first of all, you want a well-lit area to start with because then you can use lower ISO. Or you want to bring in your own lights. Maybe you're doing flash photography or something else. You want to know where your ISO limit is too and how far you're comfortable going. I will also always say though, if the difference between capturing a once in a lifetime photo and having low ISO is your trade-off, bump the ISO as high as you need to to get that once in a lifetime photo just so you have it. On a regular basis, I try to keep my ISO as low as possible so I have the best image quality as possible. I personally don't go beyond 1600 or 3200 ISO with my cameras. Um, that's where I feel comfortable based on what I'm doing. Some cameras can go higher. Just because it can doesn't mean it should. So these three settings, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, are used together to create your properly exposed image. It takes practice. Here's a little... Uh, thing you can take with you, print it out, keep it in your wallet, wherever you want to do. The exposure triangle. You can see as aperture goes one way, ISO goes a different way, shutter goes a different way. It's a balancing act of how you need to get these. You can think of it like this way. You can think of it as a combination lock. You know, if I'm showing up to an area and I'm going to shoot, Usually I actually set my ISO first a lot of times. You know, if I'm inside, I'm already at 800 or 1600 ISO based on the lighting conditions. And then I set my other two things. Or it's based on the type of image I'm trying to get. Am I trying to get that shallow depth of field where I want the background to be out of focus? Then I'm going to start by setting my aperture first and then adjusting everything else around that. Or am I doing a sporting event where I want to be able to freeze that action so I want to set my shutter speed first and make sure I have the proper shutter speed and then adjust other things around that. Now this is going to vary camera to camera where these things are, but this is what you're going to see inside your camera. When you look through the viewfinder, you're going to see either on the bottom or on the side sometimes or on the top or a combination of both depending on the brand and uh, version of the camera you have. But on here, you're going to see very common things. Right here is the shutter speed. Now we talk about it as 125th of a second, but you're not going to write 125 slash or you know 1 slash 125. It's going to say 125 on the screen. Right here is our aperture. Your camera might say F whatever. This one just says the number. So it varies based on model. Your ISO usually always says ISO somewhere on the screen. So you know that's ISO, not the shutter speed, just so you don't get confused. And then you're going to have an exposure meter. So this right here, it shows that this picture is properly exposed. It's right in the center. If 
this part on the bottom starts going to the right, we're overexposed. If it starts going to the left, you're underexposed. Now, if you're a little over, a little under, it's not going to be that big of a deal. When we start getting plus two, plus three over, plus negative two, negative three under, then we're going to have not a great photo that we can even work with in post-production. You know, you can, you can save a lot of images, especially when you're recording in raw photos in post-production. However, if I'm overexposed to start with, I can't bring that back in post. Once it's overexposed, it's overexposed, and it's hard to bring some of that back down to get a properly exposed image. Same thing if it's underexposed too much. If it's just black when I record it, I can't bring out the detail later on. I need to be somewhere in the center zone here. With white balance, you're basically telling the camera what kind of lighting condition you have, what kind of light source you have. Are you in inside? Or is it fluorescent lights? Is it tungsten lighting? Is it LED lighting? Is it a flash that you're using? Are you outdoors? Is it cloudy? All these things have different color temperatures. So we talk about color temperature in Kelvin. Uh, so if you remember your high school chemistry class, uh, absolute zero is zero Kelvin. Uh, we are referring to different uh, color temperatures in the Kelvin area. And you can see down here is a scale, right? We're outside, but on their different presets. So if we're outside and under daylight conditions and you set it for incandescent lights, which is around 3000 Kelvin, you're gonna get this blue image. If you set it for fluorescent lights, which is around 42, based on what kind of fluorescent you have, you get this like purplish image. Direct sunlight for direct sunlight looks pretty good. Flash is a little off, uh, but flash is really close to sunlight, so it's a very close, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference really. Uh, cloudy is again close to that. So you're not seeing a lot of variation here, but if you look closely to the cloud color does change. This is white where this gets a little amberish. And there's also a shade preset. So based on where you are, you want to change those settings. Do not use the auto white balance because even if you're staying in the same spot, that auto white balance can change very little, little by little between 10 photos and you can have 10 photos taken in the same area with slightly different white balances. So when you go to either present them or edit them later, you have a lot of stuff to work on versus, you know, if I'm indoors and I found a preset that looks good, I can just stick with it. And all the cameras these days have these presets. So you can either white balance it manually or you can just use the built-in preset that is in the camera. So if I know I'm inside and I have fluorescent lights, maybe I'll put it on that setting. Or if I know I have incandescent lights, I'll put it on that setting. If I'm outside and it's sunny, I'm gonna put it on the sunlight setting. If it's cloudy, I'm gonna put it on the cloudy setting. And I might not be 100% accurate as to the color temperature, but I'm gonna be really close. And post-production wise, it's not gonna be a lot of work to change it because I'm already that close to it. So lastly, I wanna talk about the shooting modes. And everything I talked about so far is really referring to manual where you're gonna set the aperture, the shutter speed, the ISO, and the white balance every single time. You know, once you get it dialed in and it looks good, you can keep taking it in that setting. Two other settings I use a lot. Now I usually don't use program mode. I know some people like to use it a lot. I either use shutter priority or aperture priority. Now what these are great for is, so we'll take aperture priority first. I'll use this if I'm shooting an event and or shooting portraits or something, and I want to have that consistent depth of field. You know, I want to shoot at 2.8 the entire time, but maybe the lighting conditions aren't even. By putting in shutter priority, I mean, by putting in aperture priority, I'm letting the camera adjust the shutter speed for me in the background without me having to manipulate it, and it goes ahead and does that for me. Shutter priority is just the opposite, where if I need, you know, I'm doing sports photography, and I want to make sure I have the same shutter speed all the time, it's gonna change the aperture in the background to make sure that my exposure stays the same consistently across the board. And within that, if it's a little bright, a little dark to what I like it to be, there is a way to do what's called exposure compensation where you can tell it to be a little brighter, a little, a little darker based on where you want it. It's still gonna set all the other settings for you in the background. You're just controlling that one aspect of the image. Now, a couple other things to look at. Right here, this rule of thirds. This is a video I want you to watch that talks about the rule of thirds 
uh, really good explanations and good examples on what that is. So something rule thirds is something I want you to keep in mind when you're doing all your photography and video work. Um, it is just a great uh, way to compose your images so that they're always interesting. Right here, this is a camera simulator. So all those things we just talked about, for instance, so we can do this without a camera. There is a airplane with a spinning prop on it. Right now, our aperture is at eight, our shutter speed is at 1 60th, our ISO, ISO is at 1600. And if I take that picture, this is what it looks like. We have a blurry image on the propeller because we took a slow shutter speed. F8 has a lot of things in focus, but not everything. Now let's just change that up a little bit. So we're in full manual right now. We're going to go to F2.8 and see what that looks like. Oh, we didn't change anything else. See, I only changed one thing. My exposure is way too much, so I actually have to increase my shutter speed until I'm back in the proper exposure. And it says good exposure. So my shutter speed is at now 1 750th of a second. And there we go. And actually, look, that's slowed down a little bit. Maybe I just want to work on that. This is where if I do shutter priority and I speed this up, to where I know can capture that, it's going to adjust things like, look, my ISO just changed to 3200. So I can capture that still. Although it's still not there, let's go a little faster. And boom. Now I've captured that propeller moving. Or maybe I want to do after priority and I want to make sure everything's in focus. So I change it to F22 and I do this. So this is definitely even before you get your hands on the camera, if you want to come in here to the simulator provided free by Canon, it gives you a good idea of how those different things work together. And then down here, these are the, the first two projects I want you to work on. So you have the depth of field. Uh, this also has another video walkthrough to explain the whole project for you. I walk through the project itself and do an example project right in front of you so you can see how that's done. And then soon I'm also going to be posting the shutter speed. There's nothing in there just yet. Um, that'll be up uh, in a little bit as well. So that's the basic walkthrough of the photography module. If you have any questions, please let me know. I do encourage you to go and review this photography basics on your own as well. Just review the information. Please make sure you watch the rule of thirds video and try out the camera simulator before you go out and do any of your assignments. And then start working on that the field assignment first and then Again, shutter speed is going to be up shortly, so start working on that one as well. If you have any questions, please let me know, and have a great week.